Good afternoon, Sean here, Mountain's Garage. If I knew you were coming, maybe I would have put on some clean clothes. Probably not. Today's subject, believe it or not, still talking about the Turbo 400. This is going to be How It Works Part 2. We're going to dive into the lower gear unit and the clutch packs, how they operate, what they do, and do you need more clutches? That's a really popular fodder. It's popular fodder for internet conversations, if you will. Everybody has an opinion. I guess I do too. So let's start with what happens inside your transmission when you put her in gear. This is a forward clutch drum. Sitting on top of a direct drum. This is just how it goes into the transmission. They run this close to each other. Power is available through the torque converter. The engine's running. There's oil being thrown around in there. The turbine is ready to supply power down through the transmission. If we're in park or neutral, it goes no further than this shaft. When you select any forward gear... The forward clutch pack comes on. There's a piston that's going to squeeze the clutches and steels against this pressure plate, snap ring. So now you're driving this hub. This was already spinning at engine speed. You apply the clutches. Now you're driving the forward hub. These splines are driving the small shaft on the lower gear unit. Looking at the lower unit installed into a transmission case, it takes two and a half turns of the small shaft to get one turn of the output shaft. It's actually 2.48. And that gives you first gear. But what I want you to notice is the sun shaft is rotating counterclockwise. That's the next biggest splined shaft. So, two and a half turns in here, one turn of the output shaft. That's maximum reduction. 2.48 plus about two and a half in the converter. It's almost five to one in low gear. First gear. The clutches in the forward drum, when you put it in any forward gear, they just come on. They don't have to come off and on. It's not a shifting clutch. It's just on to drive the rest of the transmission. It leads a relatively easy life. You can see on this end, you can still see the markings on the clutches. This clutch pack typically starts with a wave plate against the piston to allow some cushion when you put it in gear so it doesn't bang right in. The same reason they separate the halves of the piston that apply this set of clutches in the forward drum. And I typically leave the inner seal off so I get the full piston at apply time. And I also seldom, if ever, use a wave plate. Because I have a loose torque converter, it won't really bang in gear. This set of clutches is smoked. It definitely starts down near the wave. And by the time you get to the top, they don't look too bad. That clutch is you know, usable, if you will, starting to smoke on the backside. But it's a typical burned up set of clutches. I don't know how many miles this transmission had on it, but do you need extra clutches in the forward? I often do it. I've never done more than six. I've heard people putting more than that. Uh, like I mentioned at the beginning of the video, extra clutches is a hot button. With proper hydraulics, if you boosted up the pump output, and you have enlarged feed holes, you've done away with accumulators, everything made to soften shifts, it's a good chance, and it's been proven, that this Turbo 400 will last with five clutches and steels in the forward, five clutches and steels in the direct, and three clutches and steels in the intermediate. Do you need more? That's, I guess we'll cover that at the end. But the forward clutch... Uh, pack is just for driving the transmission gear train forward. It's not on in reverse, neutral or pack. Next let's talk about what happens on the second gear shift. This is the direct third gear 
clutch drum, but on the back is the race for the sprag, which is on the back. It free wheels this way, locks this way to the drum. And inside the direct drum is the splines for the sun shaft, which I just told you to remember a few minutes ago that it's turning counterclockwise at two and a half times the engine RPM. So this whole drum with its clutches, whether you add it extra or not, this is a steel drum. This is the reason why they make aluminum ones. This thing is spinning in the opposite direction, two and a half time engine RPM, when we apply these clutches here to stop it. So we've applied the intermediate clutch pack. We have stopped this drum from rotating. And now it's just sitting stationary in the transmission, holding the sun shaft still. When we hold the sun shaft and continue to drive the main shaft, now we're turning one and a half revolutions here to one revolution of the output shaft. So the second gear is 1.48 to 1 because we're holding the sun shaft. The Turbo 400 has three clutches and three steels in the intermediate clutch pack. They're lugged to the case. That's how they effectively stop the rotation of the drum. These are two intermediate clutch packs. This is stock Turbo 400. It's three clutch, three steels, and a thick pressure plate that is 435 thousandths. It is the exact height of the 4L80 four clutch, four steel, thinner pressure plate unit. You could run either one of these if you have a 4L80E drum, and I'll get to that in a minute. GM did see fit to put extra clutches here. Use that as your determination whether it's a worthy upgrade because you need to purchase thinner clutches and steels. So while there's more of them, they're thinner. And people will argue about heat and what becomes of the thinner clutches and steels. These are much more robust, but there's only three of each. And sometimes there's also a wave plate, again, to cushion the apply to help save the sprag. This is the sprag we upgrade to 34. This is the 34. Typically it has the roller unit or only a 16, <clears throat> depending on what it had originally. Beyond 34, the Pro Mod type drum is a 36. You probably don't need it. People will debate the horsepower level, but it's substantially higher than anything I can afford to make with an engine. <laughs> couple thousand anyway you probably need the 36 element probably going to come attached to an aluminum drum all reasons because this has to start rotating the lighter this unit is that's why people argue that too many clutches make it heavier i don't think one clutch in steel makes that big a difference they also will talk about these are waffle clutches they'll call them these are quite aggressive there's four of those these are thin high energy but they're smooth. You know, which one is actually easier on the sprag? Lots of debate right here. When you compare the 4L80E clutch pack on the left with the thinner clutches and steels to the Turbo 400 on the right, you'll see the last clutch is higher. That's why the 4L80E drum is thicker in that same direction. These, this would slide into this in this direction. There's more meat up here to contain that last clutch when it applies. It gives them room to move. The 400 uh, intermediate sprag race is thinner in this direction. And my fear is it would push the clutch off the edge. So I don't put the 4L80E four clutch pack without the 4L80E drum. Some people claim they do it. I don't know how long until it wears where it would force the clutch off the end, or if it ever will. But GM made this thicker when they went to four clutches. So I use that as my guide. We survived the wide open throttle second gear shift. We're still accelerating, now it's time for high gear, direct.
third, whatever you want to call it. Last time we saw the direct drum, it was being held still by the intermediate clutch pack and the sprag. It wanted to go counterclockwise, but it can't. It's just sitting still. Inside, we're going to apply oil to the piston. It's going to squeeze the clutches and steels up tight against the pressure plate and the snap ring. The teeth on the direct clutches are splined to the pressure plate on the back of the forward clutch drum. This is already turning engine RPM. When we lock them, lock the direct clutch, we make it one-to-one -one with the forward. When you turn both shafts on the gear unit at the same speed, you get one turn out here. One-to-one, -one, no reduction. The direct clutch drum is free to rotate in the direction of the engine. The whole time you're driving along in high gear, the sprag is ineffective. It's just spinning on itself. This greasy monster, a TH-475 from a motorhome, is my inspiration of what GM thought the areas that needed the tension or upgrading should be. They made a straight cut planetary unit for a reason. Experts will tell you you don't need it. The stock bevel cut lower gear unit in a turbo 400 will take more power than I can afford once again. No issues in that area. If it goes bad, it's probably because it was assembled incorrectly. Pots were left out. Something happened to it. If you have a good lower gear unit, you don't need to really search out a straight cut TH-475 unit. But if you have it, there's certainly no drawback that I'm aware of. Also in the TH-475, they left the inner seal out of the forward clutch. So they were feeding it the full, all the time, both sides. An upgrade I always do. And in the direct clutch, they put six clutches and six steels. They didn't improve the intermediate. That's still three clutches, three steels, no wave plate. So that is an improvement, I guess. Some passenger car or light truck units did have a wave plate on the intermediate to cushion the blow. They did away with it on the 475. In the forward drum, it was still five clutches, five steels. But once again, they lost the wave plate. In this video, I've used the word experts several times. I am not one, but I'm glad there are those out there that are willing to share their time and knowledge. Most will universally agree the secret to clutch longevity is not the clutch material or style or even the number, it's hydraulic pressure and the delivery and timing of that. This is an old Turbo 400 pump without the scallop to feed in extra oil. A lot of these have a scallop you'll see around the outside in one spot to let oil in to help lubricate itself. I seldom find a whole lot of problems with the Turbo 400 pump. It's only asked to, even when you turn them up, it's only 200 PSI. Most hydraulic systems run at thousands. This at 200, it has a relief valve to get rid of the extra pressure. It only has to make 200. Not a problem. Stock it made 150 to 170. It's not like we're drastically turning it up. I don't see any wear issues. At least in my part of the country. Now, I've thought about that because a lot of people have asked me and a lot of people have their opinion on turning up the pump and then street driving it. Where I'm from, the vehicle's rusted out first. So most of the transmissions I see are relatively low miles. If you're out west, it's possible a transmission could have three or 400,000 miles on it before it was hot rodded. Most of the ones I see probably have 100 at most. Maybe that leads to some people's opinions about turning up the pressure is going to ruin the pump. Well, I spent a lot of time working on other hydraulic systems unrelated to transmissions, and 200 PSI is nothing, especially for this heavy-duty cast iron pump. So, my opinion on that, turn it up and run it.
Give it a good filter. Don't starve it for oil. You need the one without the Dacron, the manila colored stuff you can see in the window of the filter. You don't want that. You just want the screen. It's nothing but a rock screen, really, but it does do a relatively good job of protecting the pump, but not restricting it. All right, if you're still with me watching, you might be interested in this subject as much as I am. I'm not an expert on the Turbo 400. It's just through sheer repetition of handling the parts, curious as to how everything did work, knowing how it works makes it easier to understand what can or should be modified. So it's one big circle. I get more and more people sending me messages telling me they're no longer afraid and they're gonna give it a try themselves. And I hope they're all successful. My biggest piece of advice is take your time. If it feels wrong, it probably is. The answer to your question is out there. Don't rush through it just to get it done only to have it fail instantly. That's not any fun. And it gets expensive in a hurry. A few years ago, I decided to focus on the Turbo 400 because personally, I mean, hot rod, car, truck, race car, it's kind of universal, especially with the uh, popularity now of turbo power and the rear end ratios coming down numerically. So mid threes are pretty common with a 28 inch or 30 inch rear tire. That's drivable without an overdrive. The expense, electronics, etc., extra weight with the 4L80E with overdrive, even though it's a lot of a Turbo 400, it is a lot heavier. Added complications, you don't necessarily need it anymore. It's drivable with a Turbo 400, and like on the Drag Week stuff, they're putting a give end as overdrive behind the Turbo 400. Also a popular combination, but not anything I'm gonna need right off. I've actually had a give end as in a one ton dually. And while it was neat, it wasn't as significant a drop as I was used to, because I didn't have a lockup torque converter to go with that. But nowadays you can put a lockup in a 400 too, but the price range just went a lot higher than I'm normally used to dealing with. I made the decision several years ago to do mostly just turbo 400s. I'll rebuild other transmissions, but I'm not gonna stock parts for them. The last four or five weeks, like I mentioned, I've been doing nothing but turbo 400s and I used up all my parts and I had to reorder everything pretty much at once. When you're buying boxes of 100 clutches of steels and they're three bucks a piece or more, that adds up in a hurry. And gasket sets, I mean, the more you buy, the cheaper they are if you could shop around for deals, but you know, it doesn't take long to reinvest your profit back into stock. So maybe someday in the future, I'll make a dollar on that. You never know. But anyway, thanks for watching. Like, share, subscribe. Have a great day. Talk to you soon.